Good morning. Good morning. Well, we are going to be talking about pressure points this week. How many of you, I asked you this question last night, but how many of you have experienced pressure in life? All right. There's all kinds of pressures in life, and you cannot get through life you can't really get through a day in life without experiencing and dealing with pressure. It's common to all of us. So as we talk about these pressure points this week, the one thing that we can know is these are things that we all might experience in varying degrees, but we all have this in common. We all deal with pressure. And there's a lot of ways that we handle pressure in life, and some of them are not always so healthy, are they? And what I've noticed is that we tend to want to deal with the pressure sometimes in some very unhealthy ways. Sometimes we seek escapes from our pressure, don't we? Have you ever sought an escape from pressure? All right, sometimes we use food to escape, right? Yesterday was National Ice Cream Day. So I hope that you celebrated it properly. If you did not, the good news is the ice cream is still there today. And it will be there every day you're here. So take advantage of that. But food can be an escape and food can become an unhealthy escape for our pressure. Sometimes we use television or movies or entertainment. We just think I've got, and those things aren't necessarily wrong, but we use them as escape from our pressure. Sometimes it's sleep. Sometimes it's procrastinating. Sometimes we lash out. Sometimes we turn to drugs or alcohol or something to dull the pain or to take it away. Sometimes we turn to things like self-harm, something that we feel like we can control so that we can deal with the pressure. And I want you to realize this morning that, that God understands pressure and He has a way for you to handle and deal with the pressures of life. And we're going to look th this week at what James had to say about some significant pressure points. And I want you to see with me how God enables us to deal with some of these things in a better way, in a healthy way. Because He knows about the pressures. And He doesn't want us to use unhealthy coping mechanisms. He wants us to learn to trust Him with the pressures that we face and see the answers that He has, to follow Him, to utilize His wisdom and His guidance for the pressures of life. You know, a lot of times I think we think of pressure as a negative thing. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times where I wish that I could go throughout life with no pressure. How many of you would like a, a life with no pressure? No problems, no stress, no worries. Wouldn't that be great? We think that that would be so great if our life didn't have any problems. For me, that would mean that the coffee pot was always full and overflowing, that the kids always behaved, that there was never any unexpected phone calls or difficulties to deal with. And we think that that would be good. But if we were really honest this morning, I think we'd realize that it wouldn't be good for us. In fact, we're going to see that God ordains pressure to accomplish His purpose and His will in our life. Because here's something I want you to understand as we get started. God does not intend for you to live a life free from pressure and problems. God does not intend for you to live a life free from pressure and problems. Some of you might be feeling the pressure of being homesick right now. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you're homesick right now, if you're missing home just a little bit, here's what I want you to know. You have a great home. That's why you miss it. And that's a thing to rejoice in. But God's brought you here, and He'll get you through. But God does not intend for you to live a life free from pressure and problems. We're going to look at the book of James this week. It was written by Jesus' brother, his half-brother. Uh, obviously, Jesus was not the son of Joseph physically, but James was. And so James is the brother of Jesus. Really interesting perspective that we get to have from him because James grew up with Jesus, but he did not grow up believing that Jesus was who he claimed. And I have a just an average guess here that, that you probably wouldn't have either, right? I mean, if you how many of you have a sibling? All right, if your sibling claimed to be the Messiah come from God, would you believe them? <laughs> no, you wouldn't, all right? And so Jesus' brothers and his family, they really struggled to grasp these claims that, that, that Jesus made about himself. But after Jesus dies and rises from the dead, even James, his brother, realizes that what Jesus said was true. He becomes a believer. He becomes an influential leader in the church in Jerusalem. And he's the author of this book that we're going to be looking at. And as he's writing to these early believers, in fact, this is the, the earliest New Testament writing that we have. 
It's the oldest of the New Testament writings. And James is writing to a very young and early church that's dealing with a lot of pressure because they're being persecuted for their faith. Many of the people that he's writing to have had to scatter because of the persecution that they were facing in Jerusalem. So he's writing to people that are dealing with pressure. He's writing to people that are dealing with problems. And they're also facing pressures in their faith. And so we're going to look at those this week. And he challenges them to live out their faith no matter what the circumstances of life may bring. And that's what I want you to come to a realization this week, is that God wants you to live out your faith in Him, not because of your circumstances, but through them and in spite of them. James challenges his believers, the believers that he was writing to, and ultimately us, because God intended this for us as well, that there's a profound difference between believing in God and believing God. And that's where I want you to, what I want you to wrestle with this week is do I believe in God or do I believe God? You see, there is a profound, profound difference between believing in God and believing God. So this morning, we're going to look at the first pressure point, and we're going to look at the pressure point of trials. And I know it's kind of a, a heavy thing to jump into on the first day of chapel, but it's where James chooses to begin his book. It's where his readers were at, and it may be where you're at. I don't know a lot of you. I don't know the circumstances that you left when you came here, but I can guess that some of you have left some very difficult circumstances to come here. And those circumstances are waiting for you when you get back. There's something else I know about all of us. Trials are part of life. You will experience trials, and few pressure points compete with trials. They're hard. They're difficult. So let's look at what James has to say about trials and how we're to look at that. So read with me, James chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4 this morning. So if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open it, because it is on the screen, but we're going to be moving around a little bit. So I want you to have your Bible open. James chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 1. James says this, He's, he introduces himself as James, a servant of God. Literally, in the Greek, it's the word slave. He says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, once he came to faith in who Jesus was, it was no longer just his brother. But he now referred to him as the Lord Jesus Christ. He says to the twelve tribes, again, James is writing very early. That it's primarily a Jewish audience, Jewish believers that have come to faith in Christ that he's writing to. He says, greetings. And then he says in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let the steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James introduces himself as a slave, as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he jumps right into this thought. He says, count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. I don't know about you, but that seems like a really odd way to open up a book or letter, doesn't it? Count it all joy. I don't know about you, but joy and trials are not something that I would naturally put together. Would you? All right. Joy and trials do not naturally go together. This word, trials, that James uses here, it literally means this. It means a trying or a testing. And then James uses the word various to modify it. And so he says, he says, count it all joy, and we're going to get back to that, when you meet trials of various kinds. See, there's all kinds of trials in life, aren't there? All kinds of trials. There's physical trials. Some of you maybe have been through them. Maybe you're in one right now where you're dealing with something physical, a disease, a condition, an injury. There's financial trials. And hopefully you, at your age, don't have to worry about some of those things so much, but financial trials and difficulties are a part of life. Sometimes there's spiritual trials where you're going through a really difficult time spiritually. Many times we go through emotional trials. And maybe you're fighting some of those emotional trials right now and you're dealing with some heavy emotional things. There's family trials. And I want you to know, I know something about your family. I've been doing a little research. Your family's not perfect, is it? My family's not perfect. There's trials that we face in our family. Sometimes it's at work. Sometimes it's at school. I faced a lot of trials when I was in school. James says, there are various trials that we're going to go through. And Jesus says, you will go through these trials. I will allow you to go through some of these trials. In fact, listen to what Jesus said. John chapter 16, verse 33. 
Jesus said this the night before he died. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace because in the world you will have tribulation. So when we encounter trials and we encounter difficulties, it shouldn't shake our faith. It, it shouldn't shake our confidence because it's the very thing that Jesus said would happen to us. They have overcome the world. And so as we look at, at how we're to experience trials, as James is writing to the early church about how to handle the pressure of trials, he's writing to them with the perspective that Jesus had, which is trials will come, and trials will be big, and trials will be hard, and trials will put pressure on your life, but Jesus is bigger than your trial. And Jesus is greater than your trial. He has overcome the world, and He lives in you. If you know Christ. He lives in you if you know Christ. God will not always protect you from trials. He could, right? We, we know that God is big enough to protect us and keep us from going through a trial. But because God loves us and because God has plans that are often greater than our plans, sometimes He ordains that we would walk through trials. And it puts incredible pressure on our life. So James says, I want you to count it all Joy. Count it all joy. What's he saying? James is saying we have to change the way that we think about our trials. We have to change the way that we think. This word count has to do with our mind. It literally means to lead. And so he says count it all joy. He's saying you need to lead your mind differently. You need to think differently about the circumstances that are happening to you. Because God has a purpose and God has a plan. And even though it doesn't make sense, God wants you to consider it, to deem it, to think about it differently. And he says I want you to think about it as a joyful thing. And that's not a natural response. That's not going to come naturally. Joy is not a natural response when we encounter trials. It's not a natural reaction. You see, our, our natural reactions tend to be different, don't they? What are some of your natural reactions to pressure, the pressure of trials? Somebody, somebody want to share what a natural reaction might be? Anybody? Yes. Frustration, absolutely, yes. I'm sorry. Like just trying to hide. Trying to hide, escape, frustration, yes. Pain. Pain. Stress. Stress. Ever get angry, right? Anger, stress, pain, hurt, denial. Sometimes we might say this isn't happening, this isn't real. But joy isn't our natural reaction to a trial. James says if we're going to experience joy in our trials, which is God's plan and God's will for us, that we have to think differently. You see, joy, you know, we think of joy as this something that happens to us. But joy is a work of God in us. It's a gift from God. And your experience of that gift has to do with your willingness to think differently. And so joy then is not so much just an emotion that we feel, but it is a careful and deliberate decision. I don't know if you've ever thought about joy that way. But joy is a careful and deliberate decision. It's a choice to trust God. James says, consider it joy when you meet a trial. And then he gives us a little bit more of the why. Look in verse 3 with me. He says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You see, God has a purpose for the trials of life. He doesn't just carelessly allow things into your life. The things that happen to you are filtered through the hand of a Heavenly Father who loves you and who has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your trial. You see, trials often take us by surprise, don't they? We often would say things like, I didn't see that coming. I never expected that this would happen. But God knew it all along. Trials never take God by surprise and he wants to use them to grow our faith because your faith is very much like a muscle. Did you know that? That faith is like a muscle and we know something about our muscles. We have to what? We have to exercise them in order to strengthen them. That, that just sitting in a chair all day will not strengthen your muscles, will it? In fact, your muscles will what? They'll atrophy, they'll shrink. In the same way, when we don't exercise our faith, it shrinks. But when we exercise our faith, when we choose to use our faith, God grows our faith. Every trial 
is a test. God wants to produce this quality of steadfastness. Look there in verse 3. He says, the testing, the trying of your faith produces steadfastness. It literally means endurance. God wants to give you a faith that endures, that's strong, that's ready to meet the challenges of life. And faith is the key to this. Because if you're going to experience joy and you're going to experience this different way of thinking that James is talking about, it's going to require an act of faith. It's going to require you trusting that God does know what He's doing, that God is with you, that God is still good and that He has a purpose for your pain. See, God never ever wants to waste the pain that you go through. He will allow you to experience pain in this life, but He never ever wants to waste that pain. He has a purpose for everything that He allows in your life. And so we need to keep our eyes on Christ. You know, that's the only way that you can have this kind of faith is to keep your eyes on the very one who loved you and gave himself up for you. Faith is only as good as the object in which it's placed and our eyes need to be on Jesus and his greater plan for our life because God has a greater plan for your life than just your happiness. God has a bigger plan than you just being happy. He has a plan to make you holy, to make you like His Son. He has a plan to use your life in a great way. And I just want you to know this morning that God has a plan for your life. You matter to Him. We've talked about grace the last couple of weeks. And for you that were here, we've talked about the fact that God shows you. He loves you. You're an object of His love. And He has a greater plan for you than you will ever have for yourself. And part of God's plan is that there are trials that you will face. Warren Wearsby says, If we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter and not better. You see, sometimes when we're going through a trial, it just seems so big and so overwhelming. It seems like God has been unkind or unfair. And you may even be tempted to be angry at God. You may be frustrated with God. You don't understand why He's allowing this to happen to you when it seems like everyone else is living such a pain-free and easy life, which is really just Satan's deception. Because other people aren't living such a pain-free and easy life either. But God has a purpose. And His purpose is to produce steadfastness. Look at verse 4. He says, so let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may become perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. I, I like the way the New Living Translation says it. It says it like this, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. That's the purpose of these trials that God allows in our life. He wants to grow your faith. He wants to strengthen your faith muscle. He wants you to be able to experience His joy in trials because God is at work in your life. He has a plan and He has a purpose. You can run from your trial. You can escape. You can go to the coping mechanisms or you can run to Jesus and say, God, I don't understand all of what's going on and I don't understand why this is happening and I don't like this, but I choose to trust you and I'm choosing joy in this trial by faith, believing who you are and believing that what you are doing is ultimately good and so I will choose to trust you. You can run or you can run to Jesus. And I want you to know if you run away, you're going to waste your pain. If you run away, you're still going to go through all the pain, but instead of allowing it to perfect and mature your faith and bring you closer to God and bring you to a deeper experience of His joy, you'll waste the pain. And God doesn't want you to waste the pain. It brings you an opportunity to be closer to Him. It positions you to be exactly where God wants you, to use you exactly the way He shaped you, to accomplish the plan that He has for you. And so I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, don't, don't seek an escape. Because God has a purpose in the pain. He truly does. And so when James says this whole count it all joy and it seems so crazy and so unnatural, I want you to know it is crazy and it is unnatural. But God has the power and the ability to give you and I a supernatural response to our trials our testings. And they're going to come. You might be there right now. You may have experienced one in the past and you will experience them in the future. And I wish that wasn't true. I wish that life didn't come with trials, but I ultimately have come to know that it would not be good for us. And God knows that. And so trials are coming. And we 
have an opportunity when trials come to grow our faith in ways that our faith would never grow otherwise. We have an opportunity to know God in ways that we would have never known Him before. And, and I want you to know that I, I found this to be true not just because God said it, because I've experienced it in my own life. That when God leads us through difficult situations and painful moments, that He does have a purpose and He does have a plan. And I've been there. And I've been in those moments where I didn't understand what God was doing and the pain was real and the pain was strong. And I've had those moments where I've been with so just desperate that I said, God, I, I don't know how I can go any further. I don't think I can handle this anymore. I, I've had those experiences this year. And so I want you to know that what God says is true because I've experienced it. I've had those places where I just had to cry out and say, Jesus, if, if you don't help me right now, I don't think I can make it another moment. This pain, this hurt, this difficulty is too much. But what I found every time is God's grace is sufficient. And He gives joy in the trial. And he strengthens us and He leads us and He guides us. And even though it's painful and even though it's hard, it is good. And so I want to challenge you to choose joy and to trust God. Decision to choose joy in your trial. But I want you to know it's the way of Jesus. It's the way that God enables us to do it. It's not natural. It's supernatural. It happens by His grace and His power. But here's the thing. It gives us the opportunity to live as though God is real. Right? We talk about God being real and He is real. But sometimes we don't live like He's real. And God wants us to remind us that He's real and that He can give us His joy even in the trials, that we can experience true and real joy, that we can experience His peace and His goodness even in the trials. Because here's the thing, God knows your pain. He sees the things that you're going through. And even though He's allowed them into your life, He's not unsympathetic about them. The Bible says that we have a high priest, Jesus, who's been touched by our weaknesses. He's been touched by our infirmities. He knows what pain is like. He knows what sorrow is like. He knows the pain of trials. He knows the pressure of trials. I want you to know that, that as you go through these things and as God calls you to trust Him and to consider it joy because God is at work in your life, to consider it joy because these trials produce steadfastness, they grow our faith and they bring us closer to Christ, I want you to know that as God asks you to do that, He understands what you're going through. No one faced pressure like Jesus. Literally. The Bible says is that He prayed in the garden the night before He went to the cross that He sweat drops of blood. The pressure was so enormous. The weight of, about, of what he was about to do. The weight of about to take on the sin of the world. Your sin and my sin. As he was about to absorb the Father's wrath on your behalf and my behalf. As he was about to endure the physical agony, the beating and the torture and the crucifixion that was coming, it brought him to a place of incredible pressure. So much so that Jesus cried out to his Father. He says, Father, if there's any other way that you could accomplish your plan, if there's any other way that this could be accomplished without me going through this, then God spare me. God protect me. Father, don't let this happen. But nevertheless, not your will, but my, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knows the pain of pressure. And the Father, knowing that there was no other way, allowed His Son to experience all of those things that He was dreading. He allowed Him to walk through that trial. Because it was through that trial that the most infinite good and glory was accomplished in the history of this universe. Where Jesus, the sinless and perfect Son of God, fully God and fully man, went to the cross and He was punished in your place and in my place. And He endured the pressure for you and for me. So He understands. And He conquered that pressure. He rose from the grave. And so when I challenge you to think about trials differently and I challenge you to take what James says and make it real for your life. I want you to know that God knows and God understands. He sees and He knows the pressure that you go through. He cares. And so when we think about choosing joy in our trial, it's not just that God asks you to do this and He doesn't help you through. He's right there with you. Jesus is with you. And He'll walk through that trial with you. He'll sustain you and He'll strengthen you. He'll hold you up. And so you can choose this supernatural response to your trial because of who Jesus is and what He's done for you. Why choose joy? 
Because God is at work in your life. Because He loves you with a love that's greater than you can understand. Because He gave His Son up for you. And you and I can choose joy. Would you bow your heads this morning for just a moment? I, I believe that when we encounter God's Word, that He always wants to bring us to a place of reflection. That he always wants us to ask the question, God, what is it that you are wanting to say to me right now in this moment? Because God always is desiring to speak into your life. And so I want you to very much ask that question right now. God, what is it that you are wanting to show me and teach me this morning? And, and as you're thinking about that question, maybe it is right now that you are sort of overwhelmed with a trial. You're overwhelmed with a circumstance in your life and you've been struggling with it. Maybe, maybe you're angry with God. And I want you to know that that's a natural response to a trial. But I want you to know this, that, that God wants you to see your trial differently. And He wants you to see Him differently. And He wants to bring you to that place. I also want you to know that you're in a place where you can get help. Where you're not alone. You have counselors that love you and care about you. You have a faculty and a staff here that love you and care about you. And any one of us would be willing to talk to you and pray with you and try to encourage you. Because as we go through these trials, they are difficult, but you can experience joy. And as you think about that, I want you to think about the God who's asking you to trust Him. Because that's ultimately what's, what James is saying, is that you have to trust God with your trial. To think about it differently, to count it as joy. And that God that asked you to trust Him first gave up everything for you. He gave up His Son. He initiated a relationship with you. He demonstrated the deepest of love that could ever be demonstrated. Think about Him. And then open your heart to God. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. Father, you know them. You know their story. You've shaped them. You've formed them. You've made them. And Father, we don't always understand why you allow the trials that you do into our life. They don't always make sense to us. But Father, I pray that through faith you'd help us to do the math differently. And that you would help us to choose joy in our trial. To realize that it's in our trials that you are at work accomplishing your purposes and your will. And Father, I pray that, that our trials would produce that steadfastness, that endurance of our faith. So that our faith could grow and mature and be ready for your plan and your purposes for our lives. And Father, I just pray that you'd help those that are hurting right now. To know that your grace is enough. To know that you love them. And that you care about them. That May they know that Jesus understands their pain. May they know that Jesus understands their hurt. That he identifies with their weakness and their hurt and their pain and their struggle. And that he can be trusted. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I pray that you would supernaturally enable us to consider it joy when we face trials. And that you give us the grace to do that. Father, we love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.